You know, I've always been a very curious person about everything, you know, and and also a an experimenter. I'm prepared. I'm prepared to make those brave decisions um, and jump off a cliff and um, see where it takes me. Um, and that's the same with with flavour. And I was always seduced, I guess, by things that were different, things that were other to what my growing up years were. You know, to to just get out there and taste it all. And you know, if it's different, yeah, I'll give it a go. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. There have been moments, periods of time and establishments that have changed the course of Australia's food landscape. Pioneers brave enough to adapt to change, to deliver experiences never before seen and that help put together the building blocks of Australian cuisine. Christine Manfield is one of Australia's most influential and important chefs behind culinary icons such as Paramount, East at West and Universal Restaurant. Christine, how are you going? Good, thanks, Anthony. And you? I'm good. Good. You you had the most uh, fortuitous luck um, moving away from Sydney almost just before the lockdown happened in Sydney. Can you tell us about that? Just as we we um, we had to endure it for the first week, um, nervous, being total nervous, Nellie's thinking, Christ, you know, because no one had any idea of what was happening or how it unfolded, whether we'd even be able to drive out. But um, you know, luckily we 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 escaped, and it's like we live in a bit of a parallel universe up here. You know, it's there's. It's just a different reality, a different world, and um, I'm reminded of that every day when I talk to my friends in in Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, wherever, who've you know had to um, go through some really tough times. And I've been back to Sydney a couple of times to visit, and it's just uh, it's um, a city's lost its soul a bit. You know, it's uh, going to take a long time for everyone to to, to pull out of this, out of this. The decision to move wasn't one as a result of COVID. It was in years in the planning. No, it wasn't that um, that um, banal. But um, no, no, we'd actually made the decision a couple of years ago that um, it sort of felt like the right time to be being beach bums, you know, being at the beach <laughs> and um, still sort of engaging. I still wanted to be um, connected to to our amazing food industry, and that's one of the main reasons we chose this particular part of the world. We wanted to stay in New South Wales. We wanted to um, be in warm climates because we both love the beach and the sun. So, you know, we we tend to travel where at places where it's warm all the time. Um, so, yeah, that, that sort of determined it. We had a lot of friends over the last decade that have, that have migrated north um, to this region. So we already knew a lot of people. I knew a lot of the food tribe anyway through the Sheffy Connection and also through being a judge on the Delicious Produce Awards. Um, so I knew that there were really great um, farmers and artisan producers up here. So um, that that became my, you know, my focal point, I guess. And because, I, you know, 2020 was a year like many, many people – all my work just went out the window because a lot of it was global. And it, um, I think it actually, in, it was a blessing in disguise for that to happen because it meant that we could really um, become grounded and, um, and familiar with our new home because it's a big move after living 32 years in, in a one-bedroom apartment on the harbour in Elizabeth Bay <laughs> <laughs> to, to this... <laughs> Big house. We wanted to be able to have friends finally come and stay with us. So, <laughs> how are you coping with the space that you have now? Oh, it's well, it's it's fantastic now. We're so used to space, um, but um, it's a it's a job in itself. It's like you know, as Margie says, it's like you know, looking after a house is a full time job. And we've got three gardens, and I'm a bit of a green thumb, so it's allowed me to plant a, a quite a large edible garden that um, we harvest from. So, um, you know, that's been that's been really good. You mentioned that you've been to Sydney a few times and it's a bit heartbreaking what you've seen and, and what's happened and you've got friends all over the globe in, in food. What's it been like uh, for you? You did lose all of your work, but being where you are, watching this happen to the, this industry that has been your life, tell us what it's been like the last year for you. Yeah, I've got to say, sitting back, 
in sitting back and gave me time to reflect and think, okay, and I hate to use the word pivot because that was such an over, you know, abused word of last year, but it did allow for those that, um, and there are very many um, in our industry and others who've had to rethink and reimagine how they're going to move forward, how they're going to do business in the future. And listening to your podcast, for example, you know, there's been so many that it's it's just so, I just think, inspiring to listen to those stories and to see um, some of the really clever things that uh, chefs and restaurateurs have been and are doing because there's no, you know, going back. If you sort of... If you think that in your in your head and your mind that you're going to go back to whatever the normal was, then you're behind the eight ball. You've got to rethink. You've got to, um, you know, find a whole new way and um, and just you know draw on skills and a really I think you know and hospitality rest, restaurant people have this. It's innate. Um, draw on your your um, resilience and your strength. Your influence is astounding in Australian f- food and you were one of the chefs to early on to catch on to the fact that Australian cuisine is really global and, and an interpretation and a discussion of global cuisine. Your, your travels have been so important to the foundations of your career. Um, how, do you, how do you feel about travel at the moment and, and how important that is as a chef? Well, it's funny, you know, we've all had our wings severely clipped. You know, we live in a country that uh, where we're, you know, sort of treated almost like children that we're not allowed to do things. Um, and, oh, look, I understand the whole reasoning behind it, but th- that can't last forever. Um, but having said that, I mean, you know, because we weren't able to sort of, you know, run all over the globe, um, it, it really forced me to think, being a, a bit more mindful about if, if and when we do travel again, you know, what the priorities really are. And also on a, on a work front, I just thought, well, you know what? I've had 25 years of working globally, taking people, um, hosting small group um, uh, food adventures around the world to so many countries. I just thought, you know what? I'm going to use those skills. I'm going to just turn my focus and look in my own backyard um, because there's so much richness, so much, you know, diversity here and so many e- extraordinary stories to be told um, and experiences to have. And I think that whole sort of focus, you know, and it's becoming a broad sort of platform now where we're encouraging Australians to um, travel regionally. And um, and this region, the Tweed region where I live, is um, has just got so much to offer. There's so much biodiversity, um, you know, wonderful sort of stories of regenerative farming, um, just all sorts of um, practices that are in place. So I just thought, you know, I'm going to shine a light on this. So I've already hosted two small group um, sort of five-day food adventures up wow. here last year. Um, jumped onto it real fast <laughs> and they just booked out in a nanosecond with Sydney people because they're the only ones that were able to come. <laughs> and I've, I'm doing another one in June this year, which we're just about to um, to launch. The itinerary's all done, everything's locked in. So, And hopefully that will give the people from Melbourne and Adelaide in particular who had booked on previous ones that couldn't make it um, mm-hmm. the chance to come up here because um, – and I've changed the itinerary up a bit. Every time I do something, it's, you know, there's – because there's so many so many um, people to draw on. I can't – you can't fit it all in. <laughs> so um, it gives you the chance to come back for more. And I'm also working with a local um, – Guide, a local guy who's um, who was also my um, the driver, um, and he's also conveniently a pilot, so you can do small, you know, scenic flights. And uh, yeah, so um, and we're going to do um, little one day snapshots. You know, so you come for a full day, so it's you start at sunrise, you finish at sunset, and just do a little sort of roam around. It's just that we're calling it a farm and food trail, and it's basically going to farms. It's not restaurants. It's going to farms and um, and you know, getting a chance to talk to those farmers, taste their taste their uh, produce, um, have a bit of a you know cruise on the river because that's essential. That really defines um, the Tweed region, the Tweed River, um, and also you know the whole caldera here, which is the you know around Wollombin, which is um, previously known as Mount Warning. Is um is a pretty extraordinary landscape to um to be inspired by and to draw on. So that's th- those sorts of things is is what I'm 
you know, sort of focusing on now. I've got a tour to um, a five, four day um, adventure up to Arnhem Land in, in May and another one to Flinders, uh, Flinders Ranges to Wilpena at the end of May. So both of those booked out in a day. Um, same, you know, people were just, you know, so eager. We posted posted them up on in November, and it was just like gone in a second. And we've already got dates set up on the, on the website for 2022, and bookings are already flowing in for those. So it's just, um, it just, you know, goes to show that hopefully the power of um, <laughs> of um, of regional travel. You mentioned earlier that you're normally doing these sort of. Uh traveling uh, explorations globally and you've been doing them over the last year locally has that experience tapping in and connecting at a greater level uh, in Australia has it changed you as a chef and and your outlook with produce I think so and I think um, it took moving out of the city I think to really come to terms to, to come to terms properly really you know quite deeply with using what's in your backyard, you know, and there's um, chefs up here that are doing that. Um, like any place, there's a lot of ordinary stuff happening that sort of was always um, geared towards tourism or tourists um, on that sort of mass scale sort of level. And then, then those that, that, are, that, are, that are cooking in a very considered sort of way, you know, I can mention Josh at Fleet and um, Ben at Pippet as, in, as two examples, um, um, who just, you know, basically work with a 50K radius. Um, and so, you know, and growing stuff myself and also, you know, I just get produce from from farmers. You know, I'm lucky to have Pelissa not far away with Boon Luck Farm Organics. Um, so, you know, I just get a, get a box every couple of weeks and the produce is amazing. It's stuff you can't get in the shops. And... Um, and you know, and there's cheese makers and just you know all sorts of things. So, and I've I've found that I'm now on it because you know, like everybody, spent all last year bloody cooking <laughs> at home. Um, and um, so it was just like, okay, what what can I go out and grab from down the road? And um, and there's little there's little farm shops too still in this region where you just stop by the side of the road and buy, you know, here is sweet potato territory so you can get them for you know a dollar a kilo or something and it's just an honest system you put the money in the tin and take what you need you know it's um that sort of stuff and there's 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 still there's still that around so i really when i drive past one i stop and get something you know and i go to the farmers markets um so i've got two that that are close by there's six markets across the week that i can go to that, that are produce markets farmers markets i go to um Moorland Bar on Wednesday mornings and to Mullum on Friday morning. For someone that spent uh, a couple of decades in an apartment in the centre of Sydney, uh, you mentioned that you're growing your own produce. What's the challenges involved in putting your hands in the soil like that? Oh, it's uh, well, up here, you just, you know, you can break something off and put it in the ground and it grows, you know, because it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so fertile. There's rain, there's sun, there's all the, you know, there's all the things you don't have to, you know. We're we're very fortunate that we we don't live in a drought drought affected area. Um, so I've been been you know just so lucky. I mean, there's been a few sort of fails. Like I've had no no luck growing decent basil, except for Thai basil I can grow, um, and and an Indian holy basil which is just flourishing. But the regular sort of you know um, Italian basil, I think it's too wet. Or that the seed stock that I've had or the seedlings I've had, are, you know, that's the ones that sort of just go slippery and limp and they just die off. But everything else, you know, is fine. I just figure, well, you know, if, if I – I know a few people with basil bushes that I can just go and, you know, break a bit off and and that gets me by. But, uh, yeah. There, there wouldn't be many people in food in Australia or that love food that wouldn't have eaten at your restaurants or know, know who you are, but – where did it all start for you? Where did that interest in food begin? Well, I started, I sort of, I've always been a keen cook, you know. I left home at a very tender age of 16, so I've always had to look after myself. Um, but it was really in my early 30s and I was um, a teacher, primary school teacher in Adelaide and decided to um, – take long service leave so it took to resign and take long service leave and so we 
we went and lived in Paris for a while and um, that was 86. And then Margie's sister, Marianne, had bought um, Grey Mass, which is a, a gorgeous little B&B in Robe in South Australia where, where the, the main crayfish port. And so she said, look, I can get a – I've got a restaurant licence and there's a nice dining room. Do you want to come back and cook with me? And Marianne, like, like myself, was a teacher and a very keen home cook. So I thought, oh, shit, why not give it a go, you know, <laughs> come back. Without any sort of, you know, clear vision at that at that point, uh, we just knew we loved food. You know, our reason for travel, you know, we were already – well traveled being a teacher get lots of holidays so you know every holidays we're on a plane going somewhere um and so we came back and um worked there for the opening of the summer season and then petaluma restaurant opened in the adelaide hills when at the uh, um bridgewater mill and so i just rolled up there one day on a at, after a lunch service and said i'd like a job you know anything i knew i knew the I knew Kath Kerry and the people working there, so um, bold, as, bold as, you know, punch and just said, you know, if anything comes up, you know, think of me. And um, I got a call about a, a three days later and so I started and I worked there for 15 months. And at that time, I've got to say, in the mid-late 80s, a lot of the leading – there were great role models in the, in the restaurant, um, in the chefy world, um, and, and everyone came from another career. You know, there was a, it was a choice rather than training from out of school. Um, and so for me, it was, that was my, that was my, what I looked towards, you know, if they, they can do it, maybe I can, you know. Um, and I guess that was, um, that was really when it, it became obvious to me working at Petaluma that this is, this is what I can do, you know as a job, you know, as a, as a new career and, you know, just fell totally head over heels in love with with everything about being a chef. So it, it sort of, you know, diminishes the, all the, uh, you know, the negatives like the crazy hours and, you know, that you work and everything else. And then and having known Philip Searle um, in Adelaide as well when he had possums and he had opened um, Oasis Seros in um, Sydney and... We wanted to move to Sydney. We wanted to um, live in a big city, you know, having sort of spent, you know, 10 years travelling and being and, and always being attracted to big, buzzy cities like, you know, New York, Paris, blah, blah. Um, we wanted to, we felt Adelaide, look, as cute as it is, it was just a bit um, small <laughs> and we wanted to, we wanted to, we wanted to dip our toes in the big pond. So, um I came to, we both came to Sydney um, in, in the beginning of 88 and um, I worked for a short time at, with Anders Ausback at, um, at the wharf and, and in the early days there and then, and then started at Oasis and basically for the next sort of 18 months, two years, I didn't really see the light of day. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a full scale immersion um, into into a very refined and exciting you know um, kitchen life because Philip is very left of centre in his thinking is you know um, and he really became my mentor um, and what I learnt in those two years would probably take you know ten years of anyone else or you know you have to be fortunate to. Um, um, to have someone like that to that lead to to lead you and to challenge you and teach you and direct you and you know all that stuff and just push you push you hard to to strive for your very best so that sort of benchmark of excellence really got instilled into me in an in a you know at an early pivotal sort of time in my in my career so I knew that um, that that's this was my life from now on. So, um, and then and then left to you know, and then Maggie and I started you know, thought we'd start business on our own. So that was 1990, middle of 1990 that we um, that we ventured out. You know, for the first two years, doing a couple of dining rooms in in pubs, which were sort of you know, I guess you know these days you'd call it gastro pubs. You know, that sort of you know good food in a in a pub setting, um, which were sort of pretty um, on trend. At that time, there were lots around um, in Sydney, in particular, um, chefs. You know, because you couldn't afford 
if you couldn't afford to, you know, buy or, you know, set up your own establishment, it was a really, a really good, I uh, guess, introduction into how to sort of, you know, run a business at someone else's expense. Tell us about the food of the Paragon and, and Phoenix, which were the, the pubs that you had dining rooms in. What, what was it like at that time and what sort of food were you cooking? Well, I mean... <laughs> We had to had to cook to it was I, it compared to what I sort of went on to do. It was simpler, um, but at the same time, it wasn't pub food. It wasn't bistro food. There was that craft that I had learnt um, and the skills that I'd learnt, and also I'd have to say the biggest contribution and the biggest influence. Um, was flavor from Philip, you know, how to how to bring flavors and textures together. And they're the two things you have to consider when you're putting a dish together. And I think, you know, I just had I just had a a natural or an innate um, palette for appreciating and understanding flavors and how they work, the synergy of how flavors work. So um, that sort of has always guided me in in the in the way that I cook. Um, so yeah, no, there were there were uh, there were definitely definitive dishes from that time that you know um, that's to have stood the test of time. And I get messages from people that still cook them, like the you know the eggplant stack, the eggplant sandwich. Um, um, f- learning how to make um, checkerboard from Philip, which the ice cream slice, which I never repeated, but did it in with different patterns, you know. Um, there was a slice of pride, there was splice, there was a whole, you know, putting different um, flavours, fruit flavours of sorbets, combining sorbets and ice creams together and constructing them in a mould so that when you sliced it, you, the patterns became um, sort of, you know, visible. So it's that sort of architecture um, of building, you know, building, building flavours um, but making it, look, making it look deceptively simple. From 1993 to 2000, you had one of Australia's most influential restaurants and at the time a real benchmark um, for what Australian cuisine was at that time uh, in Paramount. Tell us how that began and what it was like um, running a restaurant that was so influential on our culinary landscape. Well, you don't sort of set yourself up to, to do that, but we were just fortunate that from the minute that we opened the door, um, it just took off like, you know, in a blaze of glory. And um, it was – and I have to say the 90s, and I think all the other um, chefs from that time, part of my food tribe who I'm still connected with, you know, like Neil Perry and Steve Manfredi and David Thompson, yada, yada, you know, the list goes on, um, would say that they really were the most um, extraordinary times um, to, you know, we we all collectively developed this whole freestyle um, way of cooking, and everyone had their own, brought their own personal imprint to the food, which is which is why we always did. And I think we still grapple with what modern Australian food is because there are just so many different expressions of it. Um, so um, they were, and I think the nineties per se were. Were, the, were, were were a golden age in terms of you know everything partying the whole the whole thing and they all we all and everything just fed off each other so it was it was it was so incredibly stimulating and it was before the the fun police stepped in and started <laughs> <laughs> introducing you know draconian laws to to um, inhibit or take away any sort of creative expression I think you know and, and I'm probably being a bit harsh but um, but it's a, it's the landscape, the you know the 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 restaurant landscape changed, and I think too by the end of the nineties and the early noughties, and with you know um, the Olympics having been here, we sort of took on just just as it happened all over the world globally, and I saw this being played out in every country with chefs I knew everywhere, um, the corporatization of our industry, where corporates or money boys were buying into into restaurant life and buying properties and, you know, so it, the, the thing of being uh, uh, just, you know, an itty-bitty restaurant owner to becoming this big-time sort of entrepreneur, there was, it was just this huge sort of leap. Um, and that, I think that changed the face of it. We're seeing now sort of, you know, once again a growth of, you know, 
and support for <clears throat> small small scale what I call small scale you know privately owned business where you know the chef or the restaurant owner has put their life on the line basically they're not backed up by by um, big boy money um, and everything they own is 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 there you know and that's what we did you know we always did so it it, it allows for um, greater independence you're not you're not having to answer to anyone about your bottom line or you you have to be very mindful of that you know being being a restaurateur teaches you an awful lot about business um, and how to you know being a good chef is not good enough. You've got to, you've got to understand the business side of it to to make it successful, you know, and how to drive it and how to, you know, how to be able to step away and work on your business and not just in your business. And I think, you know, Paramount days as as, as fun as they were, they were you know fantastic. When I look back on it now, compared to how I how I ran or how I managed um, Universal um, mm. compared to paramount with just two two totally different mindsets and i think what london because east at west was in london so i was actually headhunted over there to open a modern asian restaurant in in the middle of um, covent garden and um and it was fantastic it won you know accolades left right and center and was really going off but it was you know um owned by a bunch of money boys who wanted to see a huge profit. They'd never invested in restaurants before and didn't appreciate or understand the, I guess, the nuances of the business and that you just don't get 40% profit in a high-end restaurant, you know. <laughs> Does not happen, full stop. Um, so they ended up selling the business um, and selling the building, actually. They owned the building at the time, which is right next door to the Ivy. So I came back to Australia and knew that um, – I knew that my job hadn't finished, my work hadn't finished, and that what I was doing there was on the right track. And so basically just use those same, I guess, um, business models and principles of, um, you know, and, and the way we were, the, the food was evolving and Open mm. Universal. And Universal really was the name, has nothing to do with the movies. Um, it, <laughs> it was about... Um, you know, using flavors of the world. So it was like, think global, eat local was the um, was the catch cry. You know, um, so that's that's you know how how and why Universal came about. And it was really, and I when I opened Universal in two thousand and seven, I already had an end gaming plan in sight. You know that I was going to finish it, and when I did, and um, so I was always working towards that. It was, um, it was, and I said right from the outset, this is my swan song as a restaurateur, you know. Um, and I still get asked, when are you doing another one? It's like, you know, what is it about? <laughs> no, you don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, your food uh, evolved beautifully over your career and um, was very influenced by your travels and, and Asia was a big part of the influence in your cuisine. Well, what's been the real important shifts and in, in influences to head you down that path? I just think because, I mean, I've always been a very curious person about everything, you know, and, and also a, an experimenter. I'm prepared, I'm prepared to make those brave decisions um, and jump off a cliff and, um, you know, and see where it takes me. Um, and that's the same with, with flavour. And I was always... Um, seduced I guess by things that were different things that were other to what my growing up years were um, um, you know to, to just get out there and taste it all and you know if it's different yeah I'll give it a go um, and it was you know the travel really sort of you know was what sparked that you know just tasting food that was so different the very first time I we went to, to Thailand it just blew my mind um, in the 80s and um and and gradually we started seeing all those ingredients um, available to us in in the marketplace. People started growing. Chefs were demanding certain produce be grown, and you know, and it just filtered down to to the consumer level. Um, so you know, that's really that's really where it came from. But I didn't ever limit it to one. I, that's that was my problem. I could never limit it to to one <laughs> sort of you know park. You know, because since since the 
90s, early 90s, um, I've been travelling and working in India and then that was when I, that's where I sort of, you know, cut my teeth um, with food food tours was, um, was in India. So, um, um, and I still, I did that right up until till last year, you know. Um, so I was going there on a, on a private level, on a private, you know, capacity. Um, also working with chefs, I did quite a few years of mentoring young chefs in in different cities and um, and also um, being a guest chef in um, places and then taking people travelling. So I sort of, um, as a country, it's something that um, has gone deep, you know, um, into my soul. You mentioned Philip Searle and the importance of mentors. You've become a mentor for many in the industry. Um, what, what's exciting you about the next generation of chefs and what sort of things do you tell them when you are being a mentor to so many? Uh, look, if, if they've, you know, and there's been many that, that have worked with me that I have, you know, I guess, you know, done a back, background guidance, I call it. Um, um, you know, talk, talk your ideas through, you know, like have you thought about this, have you thought about that, just, just some of the practicalities that you don't always do and just being brave, just be brave and get out there and do it. You know, if you if faith in yourself and, you know, and what's and the, one of the first questions I ask, and even for chefs that I don't mentor, but you know that are, you know, what's your point of difference in in the marketplace? What, why are you here? Why what what what's your purpose? What are you trying to achieve? So there are many different ways that you can sort of um, you know become a chef or um, a, a, a restaurateur, and it doesn't all have to be at you know my end of the market, you know. Um, so it's really about if you want to open a neighbourhood bistro, okay, that's very different. That's a very different mindset to wanting to open something that's where you where you're cutting edge, you're in a sense breaking new ground. You're you're doing things differently and you're offering something to people that's really a bit out there. But you're you're wanting to bring your diners to to that experience. So they're all very different. Or doing a you know bloody good fish and chips on the beach. They're all very different facets of the, of the business. So you've got to if you can't identify that in the first place, then I think you're stuck. And I see it time and again, not with people I necessarily know, but you know, you you see restaurants open and they say they're one thing and they're trying to achieve something else, and it's not coming together. You know, the industry has had its toughest um, perhaps ever in the last year and they're still not over all of the hurdles are still no still... absolutely not no what what do you think uh, the impact will be on the industry and what's some of the positives to come out of this uh, for the industry as a whole yeah the positives i've seen are what a lot of the as i said you know that you know you're talking about the younger younger generation they're really fucking grabbing the bull by the horns and running with it in a way and there's some fantastic um stuff out there and businesses that have remodeled what we're seeing i think is an is a demand to consumers um to diners that how you know to and, and an appreciation of how expensive it is to open your doors of a restaurant that you know that you have a commitment you know if you make a booking you stick to it you don't cancel you don't do a no-show um you you should pay a set price you know, so that you know that if you've got 20 bookings or 50 bookings or whatever, you're going to, you know, you're going to get X amount of income. Um, so it has changed the thing of a la carte as such, which I don't think is such a bad thing because I think before we were Australians generally and, you know, I'd say first world generally were very spoiled by too much choice. And you look at a long menu and think, Christ, how, you know, how can they carry that sort of, how can they carry that amount of produce um, and, and turn it over when you're looking around and it's not busy? Um, you know, it's just, it's not feasible and it's, you know. Um, so those sorts of changes and a lot of, you know, a lot of chefs are doing either a, a set menu or a you know, set price and say three course, four course, whatever, um, and giving a little limited choice in each one so that you know it's it's bought it in so it's a lot tighter and it's easier for the kitchen to manage and I don't mean easier as being in lazy but it's um it's really important that what you have got is you know is the best that you can have on offer and to have you know four things done perfectly as opposed to 20 things done okay um with with uh, not necessarily um the best um 
shelf life on it is um, is um, you know I know where I'd go any day. So um, so you've seen those sorts of changes and also the time constraints. You know that, that having to you know staggering your bookings, which is a good thing because we all got into that. We all got sort of, um, I guess, hijacked into that. Do you want to come at six o'clock or eight o'clock <laughs> scenario? Because you had to, you have to have certain bums on seats to be able to make the sums work, and and consumers still don't get that. Um, and so now it's, so I think, a little more flexible where the bookings are staggered across the evening. Um, and so you can go at 7 o'clock, but you still have a two-hour time limit sort of thing. And I, I don't think any of those things are bad. I think they've been, I think they've been positives that, that have come forward. Um, but uh, consumer education um, has um, certainly increased uh, over the last year. Because of because of this, but there's a long way there's a long way to, to, to draw us to drag ourselves out of it. I think as an industry, we're still we're still um, undercapitalized. We're still understaffed. Up here, there are jobs going left, right, and centre. Up in, from Byron up to the to the border, um, a lot of business can't open more than three or four days because they haven't got the staff. Um, everyone's clamouring for staff. There's no, and the big thing is there's no accommodation because the A list has moved in, and they've pushed the rents up. You know, you go to any any rental property, one there's a queue of two hundred, and secondly, they'll up the price of of a rental thing to by a couple of hundred bucks. So, um, and it's not just hospitality; it's other other industries up here too that can't get the workers um, up here because they've got nowhere to live. And there's um, businesses like I'll use Harvest as an example that have actually. T- uh, got a house um, and it's become staff quarters so you know they can attract because they've, they've got they've got a big um, you know uh, pool of staff so they've got so they can offer somewhere for their staff to live and that's sort of you know and there's other big name you know Sydney people that are that are moving into the Byron Shire that that will probably do the same thing because you know that's the only way you're going to get people to work you mentioned that you've been cooking a lot over the last year uh, do you have any uh, go-to dishes that you've really loved cooking over that period of time that sort of speaks of the way you're cooking these days? Well, um, really, I mean, here it's, you know, there's seafood and there's vegetables. We've done, I've done a lot of um, a lot of vegetable cooking. Um, and I just make shit up, you know. Um, <laughs> what have I got, you know? What have I got? And um, Maggie, Maggie has kept a, a record, a, a photographic record. She's, she photographs every dish. Um, we tend to have one main thing a day, you know, uh, early evening. And, um, and so she's photographed it and often she'll sort of, she doesn't post it. She just sends it to a few friends, you know, friends that have come up to visit or ones that she just wants to Skype to. Look yeah. what I'm having. Sort of thing. <laughs> and it's, look, it's just regular everyday cooking. There's nothing fancy pants about it, but, um, you know, it just comes back to that flavour, flavour, you know. Um, um, and, you know, if, and friends go, oh, can I have that recipe? It's like, well, I just made it up, you know. Really, do you want me to sit down and write, <laughs> <laughs> write it out? You know, um, so there's not one particular thing. Once a week we'll have, you know, because I get great farm eggs, we'll have, you know, um, red rice with, um, you know, chilies and stuff through it and condiments and, um, and, and you know, eggs on top, you know. Um, it's sort of like really a breakfast food, but um, it's something when you just don't be bothered, it's our, that's our go-to comfort dish. The last year has um, seen a major upheaval to most people's lives. What, what are you most looking forward to on the other side of this? Well, I think just continuing on what I sort of in a way started last year and that was, you know, working you know sort of to, to promote and to um, champion regions and it's not just my region but that's where it all starts um, I did in a I went up and did a, um, a weekend in Glen Innes last week at their at their show um, which is so cute it was just took me right back to the 50s it was like it was just like a time warp um, but they, they, they under the under the big top under the marquee they had the gourmet fiesta it was a, a, a two-day event and uh, so I did you know, I was, I was, I was it. Did the, did the, I did cooking classes, demonstrations, and tastings and stuff. And so, you know, once again, just really, you know, showing people, I guess, 
what's in our what's in our back what's on our back doorstep, what we can use locally, what we, you know, and it's just driving in that um, that message constantly because you just have to go to the supermarket and get dismayed at what at what um, people do, you know. Um, so um, you know, so I just did things like you know these are the local cheese the local cheeses made around here. This is this is ways you can cook with them or you know serve them then i did you know one on native produce and how to integrate you know those flavors um which are big and bold and punchy and i've started doing a lot of that in my cooking here that's that's been one major shift and also you know as a as to digress for a second when we got up here i was really lucky um to meet um a local um minion bull woman um who is a force of nature um and and her mob are called curry country um and there's about three thousand in their mob and they they live just up the road and so she's very connected um, to the food culture as well. And so we've become great mates. And um, so her and her family did a welcome ceremony, a smoking ceremony for us um, in our garden when we moved in. So we're now sort of, we're, we're, we're on country uh, with them. So I'm very mindful of, of, of that and in incorporating that into into my work and so that that feeds through to having a cultural immersive experience with with any guests that come up here um with them because it's you know it's really part of our we have to make it part of our story part of our history and bring that forward so that's been that's been an extraordinary um um life experience to have happen and um so yeah so that that goes with me um, wherever I am and whatever I'm doing. Um, and there's other things coming up this year, like I'm speaking at the Regionality. Um, it's a group that started um, up in this part a couple of years ago about um, about um, uh, regenerative farming and um, they're having a conference, although they call it an exchange, it's called Farm to, Farm to Plate Exchange, and it's a two-day event up in the scenic rim, which is just over the border in Queensland, in May. And um, so, you know, it's headlined by, you know, Bruce Pascoe and, um, and Charlie Massey and other people that have really, you know, sort of put the importance of farming, valuing our soil, um, bringing in um, Indigenous wisdom into the way we practice farming and that carries right through to what we put on the plate. So and that's where my my little part <laughs> will come in with uh, what I'll be speaking about there. So there's things like I, – so I guess I've purposely looked at things that are not in the city. So the couple of times that I came back to Sydney, I came down to work with um, Marty Boats up at um, – um, at Cook Shed on the Hawkesbury, mm-hmm. so I, I consider that a bit rural, um, and I love I love working with Marty, and it's such a fulfilling. It's always it always has been a very fulfilling experience to be able to um, to cook in a very relaxed, um, laid back sort of way with with what what he's got around his farms there, and. Um, and you know, just have you know, it's it's essentially mostly Sydney people that, that drive up for the day to um, to have the, have you know lunch in the shed. Well, Christine, as always, it's extraordinary to catch up with you, and we're honoured to have you on Deep in the Weeds today. Um, really looking forward to seeing the further adventures that you have throughout Australia. Um, unbelievable stuff. Um, please keep in touch, and we'll talk again soon. Exactly. I'm not done yet. I'll still be around for a while. So. <laughs> Good. There's more work to be done. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks again. We'll talk soon. Thanks. Thanks, Anthony. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospo community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.